Well, what a fun season uh, to be in as a church. We're taking new ground and, and celebrating Easter next weekend. Uh, as Jeff said, my name is Johnny. Uh, I am the high school pastor here at Brookside. Uh, it's crazy that uh, the year's almost over. We've been doing it for about a year now, and so it's wild that this school year is almost up. Um, but uh, I just want to say thank you to, I mean, honestly, everybody in here, whether you're, you're a community member, whether you're a parent of a high schooler, whether you're a small group leader, um, it is because of your support and you guys elevating the next generation that uh, we get to see God do some amazing things in the hearts of our high schoolers. Uh, just to share a, a couple of highlights uh, for you, we have seen students surrendering their life to Jesus and, and, and committing to follow him uh, for the rest of their lives. Uh, we have students who are bringing their non-believing friends. And so we get to actually have conversations uh, with students and with people uh, about who Jesus is and how that impacts our life and, and getting to open up the gospel with them. Uh, we have students, a couple of students who started a Bible study on their campus, and that Bible study is just continuing to grow, uh, which is awesome. And, and this last Wednesday, we actually got to celebrate a baptism uh, where we got to actually uh, celebrate somebody who uh, has chosen to follow Jesus, and they were publicly declaring that they were once dead to sin, and now they're alive in Christ. And so thank you, church, for, for elevating the next generation. Thank you for all of your support. Um, I just want to say this in, in regards to baptism. Again, Jeff mentioned it, that we are having baptisms next Sunday. Um, if you're somebody who baptism maybe has been on your heart, but you don't really know how to get, how to get there and how to like, do it uh, or how to get to that point, um, go online. There's, there's a form for you to fill out. And really, that's just so we get to know your story. We want to hear um, how God has impacted your life and how he has changed your life. Uh, and if you haven't been baptized, I, w- I want to ask this, that this, over this next week, that you prayerfully consider getting baptized. What we see throughout the book of Acts is people believe, and then, and then they're baptized. It's this public declaration of an inward transformation, and, and you're symbolizing death to life in Christ. And so, again, I, I just want to keep that on the front of your mind. If you haven't been baptized, please consider over the next week. It is, it is an awesome, awesome experience. Uh, well, church, we are heading into what is called the Holy Week of our faith, where we gather together for like three times in the next seven days to celebrate three major occurrences in the life of Jesus. Next week or next Sunday, we get together and we celebrate Easter and the resurrection of Jesus and what that means for us and, and how that changes our lives. Uh, this Friday, we don't really celebrate it, but we remember, uh, we remember in awe of, uh, of the crucifixion and the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And today we celebrate Palm Sunday, which is when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Um, and, and for me, I remember the Palm Sundays of old when I was a kid. And uh, I know my, my kid's pastor tried the, his best to get me to understand. Um, but, but I got these little artificial palm branches um, to celebrate, you know, to, to have a symbol of what it means. And as a kid, I'm like, I know this means something, right? I know it does. <laughs> I, I, re- I did. And I was like listening and I'm like watching. And, and I, the moment I left that classroom, whatever, wherever I was at, uh, that palm branch quickly became a weapon, right? Like it was something to hit my brother with. Um, my, my, I called my mom this week and she was like, yeah, it was a lightsaber. I'm like, that makes a lot of sense, right? You know, but, but I knew there was some significance to it. I knew it was a symbol of something, but I just didn't get it. Like, I didn't understand the reason for the palm branch. I didn't understand the reason behind it. And, and as I've been studying this passage of Scripture, I've realized the, the deep meaning behind everything in here. I understand what Jesus is trying to get us to see. And so just to, just to kind of start us off, I have a question that I want us to ask ourselves. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? This is one of the most probably commonly asked questions over the last 2,000 years. It's something that is maybe talked about over the kitchen table or with a stranger, with a, with, a, with a friend. And in this passage of Scripture, there is no doubt in who Jesus is claiming to be. He is claiming to be the King, the Messiah that is promised to come. And so the question of who is Jesus is a question that I want to start us off with. Not, not just who is Jesus, but who does Jesus claim to be? Not did he live, because that's, that's a totally different question. Other religions understand that Jesus lived. They believe he, he was either a prophet or a good teacher or a good man. Some of them think he was a hippie. I don't know. Like, that's just what people say. But, but it's not a question of did Jesus live. It's who does he claim to be. Is he the son of God, the one that's been with us since the beginning of creation? John 1, 1 through 3 says this, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God and was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. 
So it's not a question of did he live? It's who is he? Who does he claim to be? Has he been there since the beginning? And this isn't even a question of if he lived, isn't a question amongst atheists either. This is, this is from Bart Ehrman, who's a historical um, scholar, right? He's an atheist. It says, he says this, none of them, and he's talking about uh, scholars, none of them to my knowledge has any doubt that Jesus existed. The view that Jesus existed is held by virtually every expert on the planet. He continues, Jesus existed. And those vocal persons who deny it do so not because they have considered the evidence with the dispassionate eye of the historian, but because they have some other agenda that this denial serves. From a dispassionate point of view, there was a Jesus of Nazareth. So again, it's, it's not about if he lived. It's not about if his teachings were good. We, we kind of understand that his teachings were good. It, it, it isn't even a question about if he was crucified. Most, most experts don't deny that. That's, that's pretty much agreed upon. The question is, who is Jesus? Who does he claim to be? Was he the Messiah, the one that came to bridge the gap for our biggest issue, which is sin? And in this passage of Scripture on Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, there is no doubt in who he's claiming to be. He is claiming to be king. And so I want to make this question a little bit more personal for us today. Who do you say he is? Who do you say he is? Because he's either king or he's not. This is a quote from C.S. Lewis. It's a pretty famous quote, and I think it's fitting here. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, and you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord. So the question for you today is, who do you say he is? And, and maybe you've never really asked that question before. Maybe you're new to church, and, and this is a whole new dynamic for you, and you're like, I haven't really thought about that. My hope for you today is that you will see that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the king that was promised from way in the beginning. And if you're in here and you're like, no, 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 I, I believe Jesus is king, then I hope that this message is, encourages you to continue to worship him, to see him as king. And so we're going to open up our Bibles. We're going to read in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. It says this, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus the prophet of Nazareth in Galilee. So let me paint you the picture of what's happening here. Jesus standing on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem, this beautiful view, and he looks to his disciples and he says, go get me a donkey, right? Like it's this weird moment. I'm sure the disciples were sitting there like whittling a stick and they're like, what? Like what are you talking about? I'm, they're probably not whittling a stick. I don't know if they were, but... but but they were probably like confused, like, like Jesus, what are you talking about? What's, what do you mean go get a donkey? Like this is kind of weird. And here's a little rule of thumb. Whenever you're reading the Bible, if it's weird to us, it's important to them. So let's look at the donkey for a moment. The donkey is pointing to a prophecy that is said in Zechariah 9.9, and it's quoted in this. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus is filling this prophecy that the Messiah is to come to battle and win victory 
gentle and lowly and riding on a donkey. And this isn't the only place where we see this passage of Scripture, or this, this, this reference. It's also in Genesis 49, verse 11. It says this, He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. The choicest branch is, is, is talking about Jesus. So this prophecy is, is also said all the way back in Genesis. And so what we see is there's this storyline all throughout Scripture that humanity has a problem and that is sin. And that there is one who will come and redeem humanity. And we see this right after sin enters in the world in Genesis 3 verse 15 where it says, From the seed of the woman will come the one who will crush the head of the serpent. So all throughout the Bible, all throughout the Bible, there's a storyline. There is one who is king who will come. There's one. And we're going to see a whole bunch of king language today. And so if you want to jump with me to verse 3, it says, If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. So, so right here, don't, don't miss this. It says, if anybody asks you why you're doing this, say that the Lord needs them. So he is declaring to his disciples and to anybody who will listen, I am king. This isn't, this isn't a word fumble. Jesus isn't mincing words here. He is saying, I am the king. I am the one that is to come. Jump with me to verses 7 and 8. It says this, they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Again, cloaks and palm branches, weird thing. If it's weird to us, it's important to them. So let's look at the cloaks for a moment. Putting cloaks on the ground was a sign of authority and a sign that this is the king. This was done with Jehu in the Old Testament. And so what they are doing is symbolizing this man, Jesus, is king. Let's look at the palm branches. Palm branches were used to symbolize goodness and victory and was done when a king was coming. They would cut them up and put them on the ground. And this is done with Solomon in the Old Testament. And so all these people are declaring Jesus king. Jesus is allowing them to, so he is not denying that he is a king. He is saying, I am king. I am the son of God. I am the one coming to reconcile creation to its creator. Even even in other Gospels, so Luke's Gospel actually says that, that they set Jesus on the donkey, which would be done if he was a king. That's what they did for kings. In, in um, the, the, when he goes and tells him to get the donkey, that's what a king would do. A king had the right to order his subjects to go and get what he needed. So all throughout this text, all throughout what we're seeing is that Jesus is declaring and acting like he is king. And so things are rolling. Everything's looking good. Everything's going great. But there's a, there's a hiccup here. In verse 11, it says this. Everybody's stirred. Everybody's kind of going, going a little crazier. They don't understand what's happening. And they ask who this is. And the crowd answered that this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. They just didn't get it. They're just missing the boat. They just didn't get it. It's like me when I was a kid with the palm branches, right? Like, like I knew they were significant. I understood that the palm branches had meaning, but I just didn't get it. It didn't register with me. And even the disciples didn't get it. In John's gospel, it says, at first his disciples did not understand all this. So, so Jesus tells them to go get the donkey, and they're like, okay, I'll go get the donkey. But they really had no meaning for what was happening. And here's why. I want to come back to the donkey for a moment. The donkey's a symbol. So typically, a general or a king would not ride into battle on a donkey. If they did, they would be riding to their death. They would normally ride a horse or, or something that is fueled by horses like a chariot. And so the donkey being ridden is a symbol. I'm not coming in the way that you think I am. I'm actually coming instead of with a, with a sword and a shield on a horse, I'm actually coming on a donkey to be slaughtered. Because this, this is what the people thought. 
They didn't think this is the way that Jesus was going to come. They thought he was going to come on a white horse with a sword and a shield and destroy the Roman government, overthrow them. Because, because they were afraid of their earthly oppression, which is heavy taxation and slavery and being underneath someone else's thumb. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. That's not why I'm coming. I'm not coming for 60, 70 years of your life to free you from that oppression. I'm actually coming to free you from your spiritual oppression that would last forever. They didn't get it. He's declaring, I'm not the type of king you thought I was, but I'm better. But I'm better. And I don't think it's any coincidence that some of the people shouting Hosanna, which means save us, are some of the same people in a couple of days that will be shouting crucify him. Because they wanted what they thought they needed. And Jesus is saying, I know what you need, and it's not that. They're missing the points. And so I want us to ask ourselves this question today. Who do we say he is? Who do you say he is? Now, why am I asking that? We're all sitting in church, right? Because you can sit in church and not call Jesus king. That's my personal experience. Listen, I, I grew up in church. I actually sat in the front row. My dad played on the worship team. My mom led the Bible studies. Like, I was there every Sunday. I knew every single story you could imagine. I knew about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. I knew about Jesus and the woman at the well. I, I knew about Jesus calling out the Pharisees. Like, I knew everything. I even knew about the resurrection. But Jesus wasn't king. He wasn't king of my life. My relationship with Jesus and what I thought being a Christian was, was a weekly appointment with a building rather than a daily surrender. Why am I asking this question? Because we can be in church and not believe Jesus is king. We can sit in a church and not fully surrender our lives to him. And so I want to ask this question. Who do you say he is? Because he's either king or he's not. And that's what Palm Sunday, that's what this whole passage is. It's, it's kingdom, it's king literature. There's no mistaking what Jesus is claiming. He is saying, I, I am king. And listen, Jesus came once humbly and gentle and riding on a donkey. And he will ride again. Little, little note here, this is one of the few times, one of the only times that Jesus is noted as riding. He's normally walking. And so it's significant for this reason because he does ride again in Revelation 19. It says this, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of fury with the wrath of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus rode once gentle and humble and on a donkey, and he will ride again. And when he rides again, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Everyone. And so we have to ask ourselves this question, who do you say he is? 
do you say he is? Because he's either king or he's not. He's either king or he's not. So how do we live, live differently because of this? Because every time we open up the Bible, we have to ask ourselves, how do we live differently? This is a question I ask our high schoolers. Like, how does this encourage you to live differently? Well, well simply this, we have, I have two things for you to live differently because of this. And I want to go to Luke's gospel. It says this. This is right after Jesus has ridden in. And everybody's kind of stirred up and they're wondering what's happening. And it says this. It says, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. I read this a couple of months ago just at random. I didn't really know that I was going to be teaching over this. And I just read this and I thought, that's wild. That's, that's crazy to me because, because what he is saying is that even a rock can recognize Jesus as king. Creation recognizes its creator. And so, and so what's the rock's response to Jesus being king? The rock's response to Jesus being king is complete and total worship. Again, this is a lifeless piece of sediment that is, that is shouting out or would cry out if we didn't. And so how do we live in response to Jesus being king? We live in total and complete worship. Worship meaning a reverence of deep respect and honor. And sometimes I think we think that this is just music. It's not. You worship in every aspect of your life. You will worship something. We as humans are designed to worship. We're made that way. And so we will worship something. And if it's not God, it's something else. You, you worship in every aspect of your life. What will you worship? Will you worship Jesus as king? Or something else? If he's king, and we believe he's king, then we worship. So, number one, how do we live differently? We worship. Number two, we surrender. If I could boil what it, what it looks like, if I could boil it down, what it looks like to follow Jesus into one word, I would use the word surrender. Here, here's, here's why. In order to follow Jesus, you have to first surrender your pride that you can't do it on your own. And so you, what you have to do is you have to lay aside the fact that you cannot earn it. You can't, you can't get there by yourself. And so you have to surrender your pride and say, yeah, not, not me, but you. And you surrender to the grace that is the cross. And from that point on, for the rest of your life, you daily surrender. You daily surrender to the king. You surrender the desires of your flesh, the desires of your heart. You, just, you surrender your passions. And you, you hand that over to the Lord. That's why when we, a phrase we use when you start to follow Jesus is you surrender your life to Jesus. That's what it means. You're saying, not my will, but yours. We surrender. Where do I, where do I get this surrender from? Well, let's go back to the donkey one more time. The donkey, remember, was a symbol of how Jesus was coming. Jesus was coming, not in the way that they thought, but in the way that they needed, in the way that we needed. And the donkey is a symbol of surrender. Jesus surrendering his life. And so Jesus surrenders his life out of love. And out of love, we surrender our life to him. 
How do we live differently? Because of Palm Sunday, because of the meaning of the palm branches, because of the cloaks on the ground. Number one, we worship. And number two, we surrender. Number one, we worship. And number two, we surrender. But I don't, I don't want you to miss this. Is, is, is Jesus is, is telling these people, I know what you thought you needed. But I'm, I'm here to give you what you need. What you actually need. You needed somebody to come and save you. And you couldn't do it on your own. You needed a king that was willing to sacrifice himself and reconcile you to me. Don't miss that when it comes to Palm Sunday. The symbolism is deep. He knows what we need. Let's pray. God, thank you just for the beautiful story of Palm Sunday. Thank you for, goodness, dying for us. Knowing that we couldn't bridge the gap because of our sin and you could. Thank you for being the king that we needed. 